you for joining us today and welcome to my sewing room. I think we have a really exciting show for you today. You're going to learn two wonderful things. The quilt squares we've been putting together on the whole series, you'll learn how to put that quilt together and you'll learn one of my favorite, all-time favorite arts, shadow work embroidery by hand. Speaking of shadow work embroidery, this quilt is an example, a lovely example of shadow work embroidery by hand. It's the little sampler type quilt with all kinds of wonderful squares done in brightly, beautifully bright colors that really would be a wonderful treasure to give to someone that you love. This beautiful little pink dress has pink on pink shadow work embroidery. Lovely feather stitching around the neck and an absolutely elegant treatment of shadow work embroidery on the bodice. Another of my favorite dresses, the pinafore bib dress. It has lace diamonds, hand embroidered feather stitch, and right here tucked in the very middle is a sweet, sweet, sweet little tiny pink shadow work bow. This elegant little dress with Madeira applique has two different colors, a lovely robin's egg blue and a white. The shadow work embroidery along with some regular embroidery is right here on the bodice of the dress. And come down with me to the skirt of the dress. This lovely little shadow work bow along with some other exquisite embroidery is on the skirt of the little Madeira applique dress. Shadow work is not just for children's clothes. It is just as elegant on ladies' clothes. This lovely lady's blouse has Madeira applique as well as shadow work right here on the collar. Another pinafore bib dress, perfectly exquisite, with the Madeira applique on the pinafore bib and the beautiful shadow work bow, delicately embroidered, right here above the Madeira applique on the pinafore bib. Let's not waste any more time. Let's go straight to learning how to do shadow work embroidery by hand. It is so much fun, and I have a little secret. It's really easy. It gives me great pleasure today to have as my guest Margaret Boyles. Margaret is the most published woman in the needlework industry today. She has authored 23 books, and today she has the most exciting techniques to share with you, and it is certainly my pleasure to welcome you, Margaret. Well, thank you, Martha. It's my pleasure to be here <laughs> and show your audience some of this wonderful shadow embroidery that I learned from my grandmother and hope all of you all will pass on to your grandchildren. The piece that I have right here on my table is a little Victorian handkerchief pillow that's been shadow embroidered. Notice that the effect you get from the shadow embroidery is pretty little stitches along the edge which are a little bit darker than the part that is your filling. Most of your thread is on the wrong side in shadow embroidery, which is what makes it so pretty. It's a very delicate, delicate technique. Now I'm gonna just start stitching and I think I'll tell you about it as we go, rather than just then have you, just me sit here and spend all our time looking at things. Shadow embroidery is a, an embroidery that should be worked on a semi-sheer or a sheer fabric to get the full effect of its beauty. It also needs to be worked stretched in a hoop like I have my piece here. And I've just drawn some simple shapes here because I want to show you the basic stitch and I'm going to start stitching right away. This very first stitch is always a problem because you don't have any place to fasten your thread. So I start with a waist knot. Just go down from the top and leave a little knot on the top and then come up where I want to start stitching. Later, I will go back and cut that knot off and thread this thread into my needle and end, end my thread. But to begin stitching the shadow embroidery, I'm going to do it on a straight, straight, line here for you so you can see the stitch. I'm going to do them fairly big and with a heavy thread. <clears throat> you work from right to left and I'm working on the right side of my fabric. Come up where you want to be. Make a back stitch on the top. Come down on the lower line 
and make a back stitch down here. Come back up to the upper line. Now, you can probably, you're noticing that I am going down in the fabric and coming straight up and making individual motions rather than what I call a sewing motion. This is what makes your stitches lie prettier on the surface. I'm alternating back and forth. And one of the important things that you do is always use the same hole over and over. I'm coming up here, and I think you can probably see that my needle has made a hole here. I'm going to go right back into that same hole. Margaret, what kind of a needle are you using? I'm using a number seven cruel needle, which is a big needle. It makes a big hole in your fabric so you can see where you want to go, but it has a sharp point. You may see instructions to use a tapestry needle, which is a blunt pointed needle. That's fine. It's, it's really a personal thing. I just happen to like to have a point on my needle. And I'm going to turn this over and you'll be able to see what I've done here. My thread crisscrosses on the back and that's where my color is coming from. If I hold a piece of white under here, you can see the effect of the color. Now, the smaller your stitches are, naturally, the more color you're going to have in your embroidery because you'll put your threads closer. On this little piece that I have here on the table, I have worked in a blue variegated thread and done this bow. The stitches are much smaller than I've been showing you. Probably about, I was surprised when I counted them and found that there were about 15 stitches to the inch. But that's what gives you the intensity of the color. If you notice, this variegated thread gives you the most wonderful shadings in shadow embroidery. It really is fun to use and it comes in wonderful colors. Now, if you want to do, after you've learned your stitch, and want to do something like a circle, which I've sketched here for you. Make on one side two or three little back stitches. If you can notice that I've made my uh, patterns with a number two lead pencil because I can sharpen it very sharp and I have nice sharp outlines and it washes out very easily. If you will put just a little bit of starch on your fabric before you put your pattern on it, the pencil marks sit on top of it. And then when you go to wash them, they just come right out. Now I've made three back stitches on this side of the circle. Now I can start going back and forth to put my color in. This prevents your thread from falling off the side of the circle and showing through. Everything you do is going to show, so that, you know what, no knots, no little ends of thread, or anything else that can show through this sheer fabric. And that's basically how you do a circle. When I get over to the other side, I'll just close it up with three more back stitches. Most of my things are typically Victorian and very pale, as you probably noticed with the dresses, because I like that look and I like to be fairly authentic with my colors. <clears throat> but color is wonderful on shadow embroidery. Now that when you work with color, I've done, I've started a bow for you and drawn it on the fabric. I've worked the, cir the knot of the bow just like I did the circle. Now I'm working down on the bow and I just back and forth, just like I was doing before. If you'll learn the stitch, working on the little straight line like I showed you in the very beginning, you'll easily adapt to lines that are not quite straight and curves. Now it's an interesting thing when you come to a curve like this one right here, you can see that there, this is a much longer length than this is. What you do is simply make smaller stitches over here on this side, probably from about here to here. If they're only maybe a thread shorter than the other stitches, when the embroidery's finished, you will never, ever notice that they've been changed. 
Now, if you want to work down here, like I've done these flowers, I've put the centers in the flowers to demonstrate two things. This one has shadow uh, French knots, just a cluster of French knots in the center. And this one I've done in a yellow shadow embroidery stitch. To do the, then to do the little flower, you just work behind it, pretend it's not even there. Got to get myself two or three little stitches here. This saves a lot of time, but it gives you a much prettier look too, I think. And I love the contrast of textures. Usually, I will combine outline stitch, French knots, some bouillon stitches, whatever I think I need to give it a little bit of texture. Let me get two or three stitches here and you can, you'll be able to see how this works. Doesn't that look like an easy stitch? I think it is an easy You're stitch. going to see, another thing I should tell you while we're working over here to get, the, there are two ways to work this embroidery, from the right side and from the wrong side. The right, working from the right side like I'm doing it, I find is much easier and most people do. But if you see instructions for working from the wrong side, they're not wrong, they're perfectly correct. Now, can you see how my blue is going all the way across from side to side under that yellow center? Sometimes you will, it, I usually work the smallest part and the part that's closest to the front first and then go in the back and do it. Sometimes you can have three or four layers. Here's the back. See the blue just goes right straight across just like the yellow was not even there. Thank you so much, Margaret, for being here with us today and for sharing with us this beautiful technique of shadow work embroidery. Well, thank you for having me. Don't you <laughs> wish we had all day to sit and sew? You know what? That would be wonderful. <laughs> Speaking of all day to sit and sew, we have a little doll who has been patiently waiting to show you her special occasion dress. My beautiful doll, Catherine, is ready for a very special occasion, I believe. Her dress is metallic fabric, velveteen is on the front, Look at her pretty little sleeves. She has a Swiss beading and three little layers of lace on her, on her sleeve. And then traveling down her dress are three little tiers. A tier at the top, a tier in the middle, and a tier at the bottom. Now, here is the unusual technique I'm going to share with you on this dress. This is lace butted to a polyester ribbon, and then more lace butted to the polyester ribbon also. There is just a little trick to that. I'd like to share it with you now. I'm going to move over to this board right here with some green ribbon and some ecru lace first. In order to butt uh, French lace, which is kind of flimsy and floppy, to polyester ribbon, which is kind of stiff and not very floppy, I first of all starch the laces, as you can see the gathered lace edging and then the insertion, I starch them very stiff and then lay them side by side and simply zigzag them. Can you see there how I've zigzagged those two together? Now you need a very sharp needle and a small needle, maybe a 60 or a 70 in order to puncture this um, a polyester ribbon. All right, to gather the gathered lace to a polyester ribbon, which makes a beautiful bottom to a skirt or a fancy band, I pull the threads on the gathered lace, as you can see here, butt them up to the ribbon, and once again, zigzag them. Now, there are several different combinations that are really pretty when I want to use laces along, butted up together beside ribbon. Here is the first one. This is a metallic red ribbon with ecru laces butted onto either side of it. Down a little bit further is another ribbon with uh, edging on one side, insertion on the other. And then here is a series of ribbons together. And at the bottom, I have a series of ribbons, including some gathered lace. Let's go to the, once again, back to the quilts and put that quilt together that we've been making for the whole series. Music 
This beautiful quilt is put together with sashing strips, in other words, fabric strips. Quickly, the construction of this quilt, I put one block to a sashing strip, the next block to another sashing strip, the next block to another sashing strip, and the next block down. In other words, I make one long strip of four quilting squares, and then I attach the, when I, and then I go over here and make the next long strip, and then I go over here and make the next long strip. And then these long strips are attached once again with sashing strips, attached with one long strip that comes down here and here. And these ribbons are beautiful. They're silk ribbons. They're zigzagged together, machine stitched. They cascade down the, the long sashing strips. And the zigzagging that takes these quilts goes through all of the layers of the quilt. Now, let's look at this quilt in a little bit more detail over at the sewing machine. I am pleased to have as my guest today, Margaret Taylor, who is the quilting editor for So Beautiful Magazine. Welcome to the show, Margaret. Thank you, Martha. As Martha told you, the quilt that we've done for this show is really, really special. Each heirloom sewing technique that Martha has taught you on the show is something that you want to practice before you do. And what better way to do that than to do it on a quilt. We're going to sew the quilt together and I'm gonna show you how to put the sashing strip on to put two of the blocks together. Your newer machines will come with, some of them will come with a foot called a quilting foot, which the quilting foot gives you a perfect one quarter inch seam allowance so you don't have to worry about marking or following on your machine. We've got this stitched together, and this is what it'll look like when you start. Now, when you're quilting and you're stripping your pieces, your blocks together, you need to remember to press. It's just like in sewing. That iron is one of your most important tools. You press light to dark. That means that when you get through with your quilt, your seams are not as obvious. So always press light to dark. And in using this lightweight batiste that I've used, I use a good bit of starch to hold that in place. Once you get your four strips together, then you have to put in your long sashes. I always prefer my long sashes to be a little longer than I need them to be. I'd rather have to cut that off is to get almost to the end and it be too short. And in using natural fiber fabrics or any kind of fabric that will tear, always tear your fabrics that always puts you on straight grain. So as you can see, we have our blocks together, we have our sashing strip, and again, the pressing, light to dark on everything. Once you get your blocks together, you get your top made, it's time to put your border on. This border is about six inches wide. Then when I got to the top, allow fabric to extend longer than what you need it. Then using Martha's fold back miter, just like she showed you how to miter the lace insertions or the lace edgings, simply do a fold back miter. I like to come in and mark it. That way I'm assured that my miter is gonna be straight. Once you get that done, you do your pressing, then we do, we put together our lining. That consists of a piece of fabric, your batting, and another piece of fabric. And at this point, you're going to do a lot of pinning to hold your top in place because you're going to be quilting in what I call in the ditch. And that's simply that you're going to quilt in the seam line whenever possible. When you're doing your quilting, you will want to go to a larger needle, preferably an 80 weight, an 80, excuse me, an 80 top stitching needle. That simply means the needle has a bigger eye and the thread will go into the eye of the needle and rest in the scarf, which is the groove on the front of the needle. That keeps the thread from causing friction and fr fraying or breaking while you're quilting. So we're gonna pull this off now, and this is what it's gonna look like when you put your lining on the back. See, we have, let me pull this back. We have this quilted in the ditch, even my corners to hold it down. This is a lightweight batting that I'm using that's made for machine quilting, so be sure you get that. Put your lining on, draw your corner template off to make the pretty corners that we have on our quilt, and then stitch and leave an opening 
about six or eight inches because you're going to reach inside and turn the quilt. You trim your seams and be real careful that you trim and clip on these curves. Then you simply reach in, grab hold of the corner, and you have a little thing in your sewing room called a point turner. Put your point turner up inside to give you a good sharp point. Go all the way around your quilt. When you get it turned, either slip stitch it, I prefer to slip stitch it closed by hand, and then press and you've got your quilt together. Margaret, that sashing quilt method is so pretty and looks easy for people who don't know a lot about quilting. And of course, people who are expert quilters can just have another way of making a beautiful quilt. That's right. Next, we have for you a lovely shadow work box that I think you will enjoy making. This little porcelain jar is absolutely a precious idea to put any of your needlework on. In this case, we have used shadow work embroidery with a few little beads, and look at this sweet little gathered uh, ecru lace edging around the edge. What a nice gift. Very, very easy to make too, I might add. Okay, the kit, when you buy the little jar, it comes with all of these pieces in it. First of all, there's a metal lid. Then you cut a little piece of uh, foam to give it a little bit of uh, you know, sponginess or backing. Then, in this case, I have a piece of Thai silk, which has the silk ribbon embroidery on it. Now look, do you see the little circle of thread around here, the little basting stitches? Okay. I put it on top of the little lid and pull those strings. Carefully, carefully pull them and wrap them around. There we go. Wrap the little threads around to make it fit nice and pretty. And then next comes it just pops into place. You just kind of have to push it a little bit, and this pops into the little metal, uh, the little metal rim. Then there is a little piece that finishes for the back. I come in here, turn it over, do all the gluing and fixing everything nice and neat, and then put this little piece on the back to finish it. Now, if you want to put the gathered lace, you will glue that on like this before you put the backing on. I love to collect antique clothes. Come with me and take a trip to my attic and I would like to share some of these treasures with you. This is such an exciting time for me when I share with you some of my antique clothing collection. This lovely blouse has lots of lace on the sleeve, and it comes down into interesting points. Do you see how it almost looks like a column of lace? Points on the sleeves, and this interesting shape travels also on either side of center and down the center. The bottom of this blouse is very interesting also. It has what looks to be almost like puffing, but it really isn't. I have very few shadow work pieces in my antique collection. This happens to be one of them. The lovely shadow work embroidery starts at the neckline on this pretty christening dress, and then it comes down in the center of the christening dress. It's a lovely bow with some round shapes that Margaret showed you how to make a little bit earlier. It comes around and down, and I think this is interesting also. It has some little dots. Do you see just the little circles there? Now I'm going to go back up to the neckline and show you where the little circles are again. The little circle is in the center of the flowers with its little leaf shapes, and the three little circles are right here, a little circle in the middle, and, well, several little circles travel around. What a lovely design for both yesterday and today. We're so glad that you could be with us today. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope to see you next time. Yeah.